We might ask the question, why would a group of people come out on a cold winter's night, on a long weekend, to consider events that happened about 2,500 years ago? And I think by the end of tonight you'll agree with me that the Bible is an exciting book. It's a book which can foretell the future. And so we have as our aim tonight that we're going to consider... As we look at Cyrus the Great, one of the greatest leaders ever, we're going to consider the power of the Word of God, which we call the Scriptures or the Bible. We're going to look at the accuracy of Bible prophecy, and they really go hand in hand, points one and two. But we also want to consider, ladies and gentlemen, that there is hope for the future, because we're going to see that Cyrus the Great actually foreshadows a greater king than himself as well, pointing out to us that there is great hope for the future. Our chairman's mentioned that we're going to be looking at influential people for the next six or seven nights, and we've just briefly outlined them so that you're encouraged to, to come along and uh, maybe Zoom in next week as well, uh, God willing. Tonight, we start with Cyrus the Great, and we finish up with no less than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, from Luke chapter 1, with all of these great leaders in between. So we're quite excited to look at that and what the, um, the scriptures have to say about these people. Now, what we need tonight, though, is a little bit of background before we jump into Isaiah 44 and 45. And I couldn't really think of anywhere better to go than to... Daniel chapter 2, just for a bit of background. So when we look at Daniel chapter 2, we have a dream which Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had, and he wouldn't tell anyone about it. He wanted his magicians, his uh, wise men to interpret it, tell him the dream and interpret it, which was humanly impossible. But Daniel the prophet came forward and he showed that the head of gold was Nebuchadnezzar the silver chest and arms were Persia. That's the, the area that we're looking at tonight. Um, this section just, just here, representing, and I've highlighted it in red, breast and arms of silver, the Medo-Persian Empire, um, headed up by Cyrus the Great. Then he pointed out that there would be a Grecian Empire, and you'll notice in the previous slide that we had, we're looking at Alexander the Great, so he's going to come up in our Bible lectures as well. Then we come to, to Rome here, and in the last days, um, basically a democratic era which we're seeing ourselves before the great stone representing Jesus Christ is cut out of the mountain with our hands to bring down all the kingdoms of men and to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Now, I must confess, that's the fastest I've ever done Daniel chapter 2. All right, so that's really just a, a very brief overview and not a lot of detail but we want some context there and you'll see in the maps that the Babylonian Empire wasn't as big as some of the others but the rule the power of the rule of Nebuchadnezzar was such that no one at all could tell him what to do if he made a law he could change it he could suit himself and he was the head of gold because of his great authority and his power but we see that the Persian Empire extended right across to Turkey and even across to some of the stands, Afghanistan and Pakistan, and all of them, of course, if you look carefully here, took in the land of Israel. And that's, of course, in our headlines daily at the moment, the land of Israel, the situation with the Palestinians. But we're going to see that the Israelis are a significant people people in all of these world leaders and we see that Israel is swallowed up in all of these empires um, which we see here. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a quick background and what is remarkable ladies and gentlemen is that in the days of Daniel only this leader here existed, Nebuchadnezzar. So everything that he foretold from there, and remember, he told Nebuchadnezzar his dream and the interpretation, which no one else could do. 
But even if you don't think that's amazing, well, he foretold the Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire, and the broken, fractured, democratic system, which we see in the last days, well, also about 2,500 years ago. So how could that be done without the prophet being inspired by Almighty God? We're amazed by that. So on this map, we do have the Persian Empire shown around 500 BC. So by then it was well established because the Archimedes Empire was set up by Cyrus in about 550. So this is about 50 years later when the Persian Empire is well established. It's ticking over well. And we can see it takes in uh, Turkey over here, going even into the area of Egypt here and across to what we'd call the stand. You can see India just over here to the east. And of course, taking in um, Israel, as you said, very significant, and Jerusalem being about right there, if I can hold the laser steady, and Israel will feature in our lecture quite a bit tonight. So when we go to our next slide now, taking in that this is a huge empire that Cyrus uh, was to establish, prophesied by Isaiah the prophet, prophesied by Daniel as well, and when we come to start looking at our uh, chapter tonight, you'll see that we have the Lord's testimony and that is, as our chairman read correctly, when you see the word Lord in the Bible in capitals, it's the name of God, it is Yahweh. So we can read that as Yahweh's testimony leading to the prophecy concerning Cyrus. So let's have a look at uh, chapter 44, the beginning of the chapter, which wasn't read for us tonight, just for a little bit more context, in chapter 44, verses 1 to 2. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and notice this, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Now that's significant. No matter which side you might stand on in the current Israeli-Palestinian situation, Almighty God declares that he has chosen Israel. That's not my words. That's not the Christadelphian audience's words. That's the word of God. Thus saith the Lord, or Yahweh, that made thee and formed thee from the womb. Notice that. Formed Israel from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. And Jeshurun is another title which is found in other places like Deuteronomy, a title for Israel. If you know a little bit of the history of the nation of Israel, you'll find way back in the um, book of Genesis, Genesis 11, 12, 13, and moving onwards, that Abraham was the forefather of Isaac and he in turn had Jacob and Esau. And Malachi said, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. So the chosen people came through Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. And consequently, we see that God, foreknowing all things, was able to foreknow Jacob from the womb, from before when he was even born. He knew Jacob, whose name was to be changed to Israel, and his people... His 12 sons, which of course then had more children, they grew into a, a large nation very quickly, ended up in Egypt, came out again, established themselves in the land of Canaan, or let's call it Israel tonight, established themselves in the land of Canaan. And a little further on, we see many things happening, running into the Babylonian Empire and then the Persian Empire. So for a bit of background, we see that God has chosen Israel from the womb, and he's interested in that nation. So these events being prophesied, these events, which we can now see historically, are revolving around the nation of Israel. Now, I personally had a little bit of background in some of these things because I'm one of those unusual high school students. I was one of those unusual high school students who chose to study history. How boring. 
All right, you might say, how boring. Who would choose history? I did. So I did do some of this in high school before I started to study the Bible just a little bit later. So I was looking at some of these things about Cyrus the Persian in high school and had a bit of, bit of knowledge about it, but never knew about the significance of Israel. And that's where we need to read our Bibles. Well, he then caused his readers, the hearers, of, the hearers of the prophet Isaiah, to understand that he was solely the creator of all the heavens as well as the earth. And this is where we started our reading tonight. Verse 24, Thus saith the Lord, or Yahweh, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am Yahweh that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. That's a large claim. We see in the world today, of course, evolutionists would totally deny that. But there is a claim that the God of Israel, Yahweh, is the creator, not only of the heavens, but on this very earth upon which we dwell. And being a carpenter, I know that I can look at things and see even this old rostrum right in front of me here. This here, if someone said to me, that just, that just appeared, that sort of just made itself from a tree, I'd go, nah, no. Someone designed this. Someone made it. Someone made it adjustable. Sorry about the squeak. That's got a creator. It's got a designer and it's got a creator. And it's the same with the heavens and the earth. Last, no, two nights ago, actually, two nights ago, we were north of Kadena. The moon wasn't out. We're 20 minutes north of Kadena and we saw the spectrum of the heavens, the Milky Way going right across. And like Abraham of old, who was asked if he could, could count the stars, and he was told that his seed would be like the sand of the seashore, we couldn't possibly begin to count the stars which Almighty God has made for his glory. Not to even start mentioning some of the wonders of the earth upon which we live. So as well as the prophecy concerning Cyrus, we see that Almighty God is indeed the great creator. He stretched forth the heavens alone. We won't turn up Psalm 8, but Psalm 8 says, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, what is man that thou art even mindful of him? Our God is so high above us. Now, with all this in mind, we're going to get right onto Cyrus now. Because he was chosen, ladies and gentlemen, chosen by Almighty God to re-establish Jerusalem and Judah. Now, again, a bit of background. Israel had been disobedient to their God and they'd been judged by the Assyrians coming down. Jerusalem was saved under Hezekiah from the Assyrian for a time. And the kingdom of Judah went on a little longer, but eventually their wickedness, I suppose you could say, caught up with the rest of Israel. And Almighty God saw fit to take them into captivity, into Babylon for 70 years, to teach them a lesson. And a lesson they learnt, ladies and gentlemen, because you'll notice in your Bible, if you're a Bible reader, that Israel were often caught up in idolatry provoking the anger of their God. But when they came out of Babylon under Cyrus, the Israelis were idolaters no longer. It totally cleansed them from, from that tendency to drift off with the Gentiles, that is, non-Jewish peoples, who were serving gold, silver, wood and stone idols. And they came back, rejuvenated, they came back and rebuilt the temple that was destroyed by the Babylonians. We haven't got time to go into all of these things in detail, but 
He was chosen to re-establish Jerusalem and Judah, that's Cyrus, by defeating Babylon via the dry river bed. Now, I want you to notice that. Verse 26 of chapter 44, that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers that saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited, that is after it was burnt down by the Babylonians, and to the cities of Judah you shall be built and will raise up the decayed places thereof. And verse 27, that saith to the deep, be dry, and I'll dry up thy rivers. Now that's very, very significant. This is the method by which Cyrus would release the people of Judah so that they could go back to their land. He would dry up the riverbed. And we're suggesting it's Euphrates. Have a look at chapter 45, verse 1. Just jumping ahead a little bit for a moment. Thus saith Yahweh to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him. I'll loose the loin of, loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gate shall not be shut. So it would be the work of Almighty God to assist Cyrus to come into Babylon to open up the gates of that city so that the Persians could simply enter in, unopposed. And this is prophesied before it even happened. Now you notice that Cyrus is called his servant. And in this we're going to see from time to time throughout our lecture that Cyrus typifies the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ our Lord who will defeat Babylon the Great as mentioned in Revelation. He will restore the cities of Judah and he will build the temple at Jerusalem. So if you can keep your hand in Isaiah 45, let's just do a little aside here. Go across to Zechariah chapter 6 and just look at this beautiful type of Cyrus as he prefigures Jesus Christ our Lord. And in verse 12 of Zechariah 6, Speak unto him, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and we believe that that's a title of Jesus Christ. We can't prove that tonight, but just accept that for the time being. The man whose name is the branch, he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Even he shall build the temple of Yahweh and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And notice this. He shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And I believe it's verse 13 that's the clincher to show us that this person who is the branch is Jesus Christ because no king of Israel, not one king of Israel was also priest. He was king but not priest as well. There was one Old Testament king priest that we know of, Melchizedek. That's a subject for another night. But he was a king and priest in Salem. And again, like Cyrus, prefigured some of the work that Jesus Christ would fulfil. So we see a small foreshadowing of a greater man of peace in Jesus Christ, which sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, doesn't it? Here we see a man, Cyrus, who's known for his conquests, his victories, and yet we'll see tonight that he was also noted um, for his peacefulness with those within his empire. Probably a little bit hazy on the slide from back where you are, but we just have highlighted this one point here that saith to the deep, be dry and I will dry up the rivers. Because that's how... Babylon was taken by Cyrus. And what's remarkable, ladies and gentlemen, um, in my little bit of study I did for tonight, was that Cyrus actually had a little bit of practice. He had a practice run in drying up a big river like the Euphrates because in history, apparently he came to what's described as the stream. Now, 
In these nations of Europe and I suppose to the east of Europe, what's called a stream there is probably, you know, Murrumbidgee River in a raging torrent, if you like, because they came to the river and apparently one of the white horses was so keen to keep going into the battle that it ran into the, uh, the river Gindis of the Dardanian Mountains and and the rider and the horse both drowned. It was too deep, it was impassable, but in its keenness, this marvellous horse went in to the river and just couldn't wait to go through. And it's recorded that Cyrus was, was so disgusted that at the loss of this beautiful horse that he decided to exact his re revenge on that river and, dig, and got his men to dug 360 channels and to burst them open to the uh, River Gindis all at once so that the water would go through and he, and he marched across almost on dry land with his men. Now, we don't know how Cyrus came to know to dry up the River Euphrates. It could have been a number of things. Was it that someone suggested him, look, we, we did the smaller river, we could do the Euphrates as well? Was it that someone pointed out to him the prophecy of Isaiah and said, do you know it's prophesied of you? And they would have called him Lord. They would have been reverent in approaching him. That it's written that you will do this to Babylon. Either which way, he ended up drying up the Euphrates and he had a practice run. So I found that quite interesting. And he said to Jerusalem... Thou shalt be inhabited to the cities of Judah, ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. Now you think of this for the couple of tribes of, of Judah. Almighty God was doing all of this for his chosen people that he formed from the womb, Israel. He was doing it actually for them. Wasn't so much doing it for Cyrus. Wasn't so much doing it to defeat Babylon, although their 70 years was up. The scriptures actually tell us there empire would only last 70 years but he was doing it for his people so that Jerusalem would be again be built the temple would be restored and in restoring that temple we see yet another prefiguring of the work of Jesus Christ because he will build the temple as we've seen in Zechariah chapter 6 just to turn up one bible quotation and to raise up the decayed places now, Cyrus is mentioned by name before his birth, and that is very, very significant. So we see the prophecy of Isaiah coming um, many, many decades before Cyrus came on the scene. If we look at chapter 44 and verse 28, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. But you'll notice on the screen we've also got verse 1, 3 and 4 of the next chapter. Thus saith Yahweh to his anointed to Cyrus. And I've got verse 3 there, which I think might be a mistake. Um, no, sorry. I, Yahweh, which call thee by name... So it's emphasised there at the end of the verse, am the God of Israel. Verse 4, for Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me, because he wasn't even born yet. So four times there, verse 28, three verses there, at the beginning of chapter 45, we have this remarkable emphasis of the fact that God mentioned Cyrus by name before he was even born, and he's called his shepherd. And in this, as we will see in our next slide, we've got a depiction of um, the shepherding methods of Old Testament times. Actually, some of these methods are still used um, even today, particularly in poorer countries. But Cyrus was to be a shepherd for the people of Israel. And this, again, he foreshadows the work of Jesus Christ, who's known as the Good Shepherd in uh, John chapter 10. 
and the great shepherd of the sheep in Hebrews 13. And Jesus Christ, of course, is also mentioned before his birth. In chapter 7 of Isaiah, we won't go back there now, in chapter 7 of Isaiah, Jesus Christ is mentioned as being born of a virgin. And in chapter 9, verses 6 to 7, we speak of he, we read of his greatness, or the mighty God speaks of his greatness, calling him wonderful counsellor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and, note this, the Prince of Peace, which was one of the great attributes of Cyrus. And as we've seen already, it included God giving authority to Cyrus, as he does to the Lord Jesus Christ, to build the temple. He is my shepherd, says God, of Cyrus the king. Now, as I prophesied from about 750 to 695, so without trying to pinpoint exactly the time of the prophecy of Isaiah 44 and 45, even if we take 695 compared to 550, the, establish, the establishment of the Archimedes Empire, we've got about 150 years beforehand, roughly speaking. So it'd be like trying to look forward 150 years from now, now we've got the advantage of the Bible, but if you had the Bible aside, imagine living now and trying to predict events and naming someone who do such a great work with spe specific detail, like how they're going to take a city, how they're going to ho help a whole nation go back to their own land to rebuild their capital city, to rebuild their temple. In that remarkable type of detail, 150 years from now, could any of us do that? Till the future 150 years from now, it'd be impossible, humans, humanly speaking, to do what Isaiah did, but he was writing under inspiration from Almighty God. So you've probably heard of the Medo-Persian Empire, and Cyrus, he rebelled against the Medes and established the empire. There's a bit of a conflict. He began to establish it in 553 BCE, and it was established by 550. So in round figures, let's call it 550. And you'll see at the bottom of our slide that that particular um, empire lasted for about 220 years before Alexander the Great came on the scene. So on this slide here, we're not going to go through it all, but um, we do see at the top there was even invited to reign over some peoples now you know, you could say they could perhaps see that um, their island was going to fall anyway, so they invited um, Cyrus in. But others, other historians say he was so well known for um, treating people well that um, it would have been a wise thing to do. But we've got the second point here, the fall of Babylon, um, conquered by Cyrus, and the return of the Jews in 539, just... Um, 11 years after the establishment of the Archimedes Empire, the Jews were going back home after 70 years in Bab Babylon. And he conquered Babylon and the whole fertile crescent, as we said, from Turkey across to the Stands, um, even um, across to the Indus Valley, was taken by Cyrus the Great in fulfilment of Bible prophecy. So a remarkable prophecy about 150 years before the event. And we could ask, okay, well, the Bible talks about Cyrus and we might be sceptical about the dating of Isaiah's prophecy and so forth. But we've also got, ladies and gentlemen, archaeological evidence of Cyrus's um, existence and his exploits as a great king of a great world empire. So we have in literary sources here um, even ancient Greek uh, resources which betray him favourably. Now, you must understand that when you're going to uh, the historians that the Greeks and the, the Persians, modern-day Iran today, were not exactly friends. So for the Greeks to portray Cyrus favourably shows just how much he was actually adored. He was 
uh, known by the Persians as Cyrus, their father. They considered him to be not just a king, but a father to them. And um, he blessed the land with peace. He was known for his wisdom. He honoured his subjects and cared for them as if they were his own children. And it re repeats there that he's reverenced as a father. So he was quite unlike the Assyrians who were known for chopping off the heads of their victim and piling up the skulls on both sides of the gates of the cities they conquered. There was no cruelty like that. They were unlike the Babylonians who uh, displaced people for decades at a time. Well, they had no intention of sending them back. But he saw that it was fair that people should be able to go back to their lands and to worship as they once did. And this was a great advantage for the Israelis to go back and serve Yahweh, their God, the God of the Bible. So he was known for his kindness and his peaceableness. The Cyrus Cylinder was discovered in 1879 and it looks quite large on the picture but I think on another slide we've got the size and I think it's 22 centimetres by about 10 or 11 centimetres. It's not actually that big. It looks larger on the slide than it is. And I'd ask you the question, ladies and gentlemen, if that's found um, in the last 150 or so years, for whose benefit is it that it's found? It's got to be for the benefit of Bible students who've lived in the last 150 years, doesn't it? Because that's evidence that Cyrus the Great did actually exist. So let's have a look at um, a little bit of the detail, both in the scriptures and what's on that stone. Now, going back to the scriptures just for a moment, he's mentioned some 20 times in scripture, um, in Daniel, Ezra, Second of Chronicles. We won't go to them um, tonight, not to all of those scriptures anyway. So he's well known in the scriptures, and we see that in Daniel that he prospered not only through the whole uh, reign of the Babylonians, but into the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian, becoming an aged man, an aged prophet um, under the Babylonians and under the Persians as well. But getting back to the, um, the Bible and the cylinder, from a biblical perspective, Cyrus is most famous for his decree, which we've read of tonight, for allowing the Israelis to return back to their land, to rebuild their temple, to rebuild the walls, and um, we see the size of that cylinder which was found being only quite small, you'd probably say about a hand breadth long and 10 cent centimetres and it affirms the public policy of Cyrus as described in the Bible and in that particular inscription Cyrus states, we won't read it all just to save a bit of time, but it starts with I am Cyrus, king of the world Great king, mighty king, king of Babylon, because he took Babylon as well. King of Sumer and Akkad, king of the four quarters, the son of Cambyses. And it goes on um, to speak of um, some of the things which he did in allowing peoples to return back to their uh, previous worship. There's other evidence of Cyrus. There is the clay brick inscribed in a Babylonian Cyrus's name and titles as well on this particular brick. There's the tomb of Cyrus the Great at Pasargadai. Sounds almost Australian, doesn't it? The last bit there, G'day, Pasargadai. Um, we have the tomb of Cyrus as well, and we have um, here the trilingual inscription also at Pasargadai, declaring Cyrus as king in Old Persian, Elamite, and Arcadian. Right there. I am Cyrus, king and Archimedean. Cyrus the Great, son of Cambyses, the king. Cyrus the Great and Archimedean. So we have the translations there from the various languages. Now, Cyrus was to be raised up, we see in chapter 45, verse 1, as the Lord's child. I don't know if you picked that up when we when the chairman read that tonight. Thus saith Yahweh to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand 
I have Holden. Now that's significant. You know, yesterday I was walking along Wallaroo North Beach and with some of my family and one of my dear granddaughters said, they call me old pa, that's Dutch for grandpa, okay. Old pa, I want to hold your hand. I just made my heart melt, you know. They walked on the beach and they oh, oh pa, I want to hold you. And so you put out your hand and you hold the hand and you're going on the beach and collecting shells and doing the things you do with kids. You know, almighty God said to Cyrus, you're going to be like a son to me. I'm going to take your right hand. I'm going to lead you, guide you, bring you up for my purpose. And he was like a child to almighty God. Yet another type of Jesus Christ, the son of almighty God, whose right hand I've holden. He was destined not to stay as a child. No child stays as a child, do they? They grow up so quickly. He was destined to subdue nations, not a nation, nations in the plural. He was going to be a great conqueror. King's knees would rattle before him, their loins would be loosed and he would open the two leave gates of Babylon and allow Israel or Judah to go back to the Holy Land. In verse 2, he would make, I'll go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I'll break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. God would do that before Cyrus. I'll make the ways that are difficult, crooked and windy, I'll make it just like a straight road for you so that you can proceed forward in a straight line, figuratively speaking. And the previous empire, Babylon, would be taken. Can you imagine Cyrus's surprise when he found that the gates to the city were in the river? The gates that were spoken of here were in the river. Cyrus would get a personal benefit, you might say. His empire would get a benefit. I'll give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I am Yahweh, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. Babylon's known for its darkness. It's known for its idolatry. It's known for its waywardness from Almighty God. That's why it's called Babylon the Great in Revelation. Everything that's astray from Almighty God we can call Babylonish or we can call it dark, a place of darkness. But all the treasures which Babylon once held so dear would become Cyrus's and he would take them with him. And in verse 4, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. And we've made the note at the bottom of the slide there that all this, you might say, that we've discovered tonight was for Israel's sake because he was their chosen nation and Almighty God had formed them from the womb. So once the gates of Babylon were breached, the demise of the city was inevitable and permanent. And you imagine diverting a great river like the river Euphrates. So I read a bit on the history, and one thing that was paramount for the success of this mission was secrecy. If there had been one person who'd got into the city and told them what was going on upstream, historians have said that the Persians could have got in perhaps through the gates, but they would have been fired upon being lower down, they would have been fired upon perhaps hot oil poured on them, whatever methods the Babylonians uh, would have taken. But it's recorded that on the night, the people were in party mode. They were reveling. They were right throughout, dispersed throughout the city, thought they were impregnable, and um, they hadn't noticed 
that the lapping of the water on the edges of their city had stopped. The bubbling and the gurgling could not be heard because the river was dried up and the Persians went in quietly, opened the gates, marched in the city, as we would say today, without firing a shot. The Babylonians, yes, they had heard, they had heard that the Persians were taking all of these regions everywhere and they knew that they would probably come under attack. Apparently they had stored up for years worth of food and supplies ready for that event. So they could have been the world's first preppers. If you've heard of preppers before, you know, they had been putting away their UHT milk and uh, all that sort of thing like they do today. Um, they were the first preppers, perhaps. They'd prepped for the Persians and for all that they weren't ready because Almighty God had decreed in his word that Babylon would be taken despite their confidence that the Persians could never get in. The situation was inevitable and it was permanent. Now, we said that all this was for Israel's sake, but there's also another angle too in verse 5. I am Yahweh and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me in verse 6 that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me i am yahweh and there is none else so there's another dimension to all this ladies and gentlemen i don't know of any israeli sitting in our room tonight perhaps on zoom there might be i don't know but most of us are of Gentile stock, non-Jewish stock, we're not Israelis. And part of all this, part of the reason the prophecy of Isaiah is written, part of the reason why we're told that Cyrus would uh, take Babylon before, and Cyrus's name before he's even born, is so that the Gentiles, people who live to the east and to the west, might know Almighty God. So keep your hand in Isaiah and come over to Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11. For for there the prophet Malachi agrees with Isaiah. For he says in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 11, For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, from the east to the west, in other words, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering for my name shall be great among the heathen or among the nations, saith Yahweh of hosts. So it's the purpose of Almighty God to invite non-Jewish peoples like ourselves to be part of his salvation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in verse 7, we need to understand that God is more than just a creator of the heavens and the earth. We saw that in chapter 44, but let's have a look at verse 7 of chapter 45. I form the light and create darkness. Yes, we can see that in the creation record. But Almighty God says, I create peace. I make peace, sorry, and create peace. Evil, I, Yahweh, do all these things. So we had the Assyrians who were cruel and ruthless. We had the Babylonians who made their conquests and established a significant world empire. But the Persians created real peace under Cyrus. A peaceful empire, an empire in which The Jews were free to go home, free to build, free to make the temple to Yahweh again. He makes peace, God says, and he did it through Cyrus, but he creates evil as well. Almighty God creates evil, some would say bad circumstances. God's in charge of that as well. That might challenge your understanding, perhaps, of the supernatural devil. It is Yahweh who makes peace 
and creates evil. And then verse 8, drop down ye heavens from above and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, that is to drink up the water, if you like, from the heavens dropping down and let them bring forth salvation and let righteousness spring up together. I, Yahweh, have created it. Now, I don't know if any of you are farmers here tonight. I'm not a farmer's bootlace. But I have been up north a little, and it's been as dry as a bone. And there was recent rain. Up north of Kadena, 12 millimetres of rain. And some of the farmers waited for that little bit of rain to sow. Others, I'm told, particularly the younger farmers who are more prone to perhaps taking a risk, dry seeded. They ploughed their fields and they dry seeded in anticipation of the rain. But Almighty God tells us here that Cyrus's rain is like the heavens opening up and pouring out a blessing upon the earth, the earth opens, perhaps it's cracked and parched, it receives the rain. The rain is described as a rain of righteousness, not rain of a king, R-A-I-N, it's a rain of righteousness, and the fruit that comes forth brings forth salvation and righteousness so that the rain is replicated in the fruit from the work which Almighty God performs through Cyrus. And the reign of Cyrus, leading the people of Judah go free from Babylon back to their land to bring forth fruit to their God, to re-establish the holy city of Jerusalem and their temple was pleasing to Almighty God. We'll come back to Psalm 72 because we're going to see an important type of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Psalm 72 is all about the reign of Jesus Christ. We'll notice in verse 8 that this king is going to have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. It's going to be a more comprehensive empire than even what Cyrus had or the Romans had for that matter. But notice just verse 6. We haven't got time to deal with all Psalm 72 tonight. That this king... Jesus Christ, when he comes, he will come down just like Cyrus. He'll come down like rain on the mown grass, as showers that water the earth, and he'll refresh the whole earth, not just the Persian Empire region. In his day shall the righteous flourish. When there's a righteous king, that which springs forth is also righteous before God. And there will be, what? Abundance of peace, just like Cyrus's reign. But this time, it won't be for 220 years. It will be so long as the moon <coughs> endures. What an amazing prophecy we've seen tonight. It's prophesied about 150 years before Cyrus is born. It's prophesied in such a way that we can see a shadow of the kingdom of Jesus Christ our Lord as well. Now notice this. We're quoting here Acts chapter 28 verse 20 at the bottom of this slide because the focus has shifted from Jacob. Yes, God knew Jacob. He knew Israel from the womb. But when we come to the end of the chapter, and I know we're jumping a bit here, but when we come to verse 20, Let's have a look here. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood and their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye and bring them near. Let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I, Yahweh, and there is no God else beside me, 
a just God and a saviour, there is none beside me. Now notice this in verse 22. Look unto me, not just Jacob and Israel, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. That includes non-Israel, Israelis. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Now that, if you've got a margin in your Bible, is cited in Romans 14, but it's also found, ladies and gentlemen, it's found in the book of Philippians as well. So on the next page, next slide, sorry, which depicts every knee bowing before Almighty God, we've got the quotation of Philippians 2 up there. Certainly take a note of Romans 14, 11 to 12, but come over to Philippians with me. In Philippians, we read, say from verse 9, talking about Jesus Christ, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. In a greater way, we might say, than God named Cyrus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. In other words, everyone will prostrate themselves before Jesus Christ when he is king, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we might say that that almost encapsulates the purpose of Almighty God. It's a greater purpose than that which he had in Cyrus. It's a purpose which he has in his dear son Jesus Christ, whose right hand he held as well. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that we have shown to you tonight the power of God's word, the accuracy of Bible prophecy, but more than that, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible offers you and me hope for the future.